Welcome, everyone. Welcome to our Everything You Want to Know About Film Funding class. I'm Nahid Ismail, board member of From the Heart Productions and moderator of this event. We thank you for joining us today. Today we have Lorenzo Di Stefano, writer, director, producer. He will share information with us on making and marketing short films. We believe this is the golden age of short films. Lorenzo will discuss the benefits of making short films. We have a list of questions that we will ask Lorenzo and we are also open for your questions. You can put your questions in the chat bar and I will ask as many as possible for you. Before we close, Carol Dean will share a great Hollywood story with us. You will get to guess who you think is the actor that was discovered for his smile. We will give the first two people Carol's three hour how to fund your film class as a gift. <coughs> I want to introduce you to Carol Dean. She is the president of From the Heart Productions and the creator of the Roy Dean Film Grants. Good morning, Carol. Oh, hi, Nahid. Thank you very much. Because we think short films are really important to the careers of filmmakers. They're a wonderful way to learn filmmaking and they show us how talented you are. I know this because of judging so many uh, grant applications throughout the years. Uh, we started that grant in 1992, so I've seen a lot of short films. And I have to say, they just keep getting better and better. Uh, and I, and I talked to directors, working directors in Hollywood on some of the top TV shows, and they tell me that they are still making shorts and they make them because it, one, it keeps them on top of their craft, and number two, because it gets them work. People like to see your current work. So we want to learn as much as we can from a Lorenzo on the benefits of making short films. So he will cover writing, directing, and producing. And Lorenzo believes that you have to have a vision for your film, and he's going to explain how to maintain that unrelenting vision to attract talent and money. Uh, he won our short film grant last year, so we want him to share how he attached two A-list actors and found the exact location he wanted. Uh, I want you to feel free to ask questions because we created this class for you. We want to help expand your knowledge and help you get jobs in the film industry. So, uh, Nahid, I want you to introduce Lorenzo. Thank you, Carol. Hawaii-born writer-director Lorenzo Di Stefano is a member of the Directors Guild of America. In addition to his work in film and as a professional photographer, he has a large body of successful award-winning works as a playwright and director, as well as a writer for fiction and nonfiction. Di Stefano's feature documentaries as Producer and director include the 2018 Humanities Prize nominated, Hearing is Believing. Di Stefano's most recent play is Shipment Day. It won best play at the 2016 Play Builders of Hawaii New Works Festival. It received Broadway Worldwide 2019 Award for best play in Hawaii. Di Stefano won the Roy Dean Grant Award for his narrative short film, Stairway to the Stars, starring Sean Young and Quentin Aaron, which is based on his one act play. Thank you for joining us, Lorenzo. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning. Lorenzo, you won the Roy Dean Short Film Grant in 2021 for your short film, Stairway to the Stars. First, tell us why you decided to make a short film. Well, you know, as Carol mentioned, it's often used by new filmmakers as a way into the business to explore storytelling, cinema techniques, and all that. Uh, I came at it from a different point of view. I hadn't made a short film way for many years. But this story uh, of an old actress and a young guy, her, her neighbor, who's trying to save her life, um, was, uh, was a real incident that I witnessed, you know. And 
when I first moved to Hollywood from from Honolulu. So I um, I found the script a couple of years ago. I wrote it. It was a, these people were climbing these stairs next to my house and uh, in the Hollywood Hills, and there was a, it was an old lady and a fat guy, and they were arguing their way all the way to the top. And I said, "This is fascinating." And so I wrote it all down, and uh, said, "I'll make a short film of this." Well, I never did, you know. So I found the script a couple of years ago, rewrote it as a play, and um, submitted it to a festival in Honolulu, where some of my work had been done, and they took it. So it was it was directed by someone else, and uh, when they videoed the the performances, uh, sent it back to me. Uh, the audience was really with it, you know, they were, I realized that they were laughing. I realized it was a comedy and I hadn't really realized I'd written a comedy. So uh, that kind of got me started to thinking about doing it as a short and then applying for the grant. You know, I'd known Carol Dean and Carol Joyce for some time. I live in the area. Uh, I know the great work they've been doing for 30 years. And I thought, well, let me give it a shot. Uh, because they were just launching this narrative short grant, uh, the Roy Dean. And uh, to my surprise, we won the grant. So it was a good kickstart for uh, then going out and actually pulling it together. Wonderful. Well, now, you, you wrote the script, and then you created the budget, I guess, and the breakdown. And then what was your next move? Did you start scouting locations or attaching actors or... What was next? It kind of happened simultaneously, lots of overlapping things, you know. Um, I sort of seeded it. This is, a, this is a question everybody probably wonders, should you put your own money into these things? And uh, <laughs> pragmatic people will tell you, no, absolutely not. Creative people will tell you, yes, you have to. Uh, and it's kind of a mixture of both, you know, you have to really make that decision for yourself. But I did put some in just to kind of get it started. And then with, with uh, help from others, we raised what we needed to shoot it. Um, you know, it was a small crew, but these things cost money. Uh, you know, permits, equipment. It was shot in 4K with Area Alexa. You know, that, that doesn't come cheap. Um, the actors were uh, contacted. Uh, it took some time to get both of them on board. Uh, Sean Young. Well, I did not know, but whose work I knew uh, it, from a friendship I've had for many years with her sister, Kathleen, who's a, a writer and a uh, creative person in LA, suggested when she heard I was doing this, she says, why don't you give, send us to Sean? Uh, sounds like she could fit that part, even though she's a bit younger than the character, like by about 10 years. Uh, so we did, and Sean liked the script. She was a little wary of it and she says geez i don't know if i want to play an old bag uh, you know uh i was a big star and now look at me i'm playing these old crone these old crones i said well sean you know uh you know the, the, you know, i think you're gonna get not to want to oversell her but i wanted her to feel that i had confidence that she, with with the wig and makeup uh and a strange thing, people have been watching the film who don't even know it's her, John Young, until a point in the movie when the Tony character whips out his phone and shows a bunch of old photos. And they're of Sean from Blade Runner and Wall Street and No Way Out, all the big hits that she made in the 80s. And they go, holy crap, that's Sean Young. Uh, so she was able to sort of submerge herself in this character. Quentin Aaron, uh, you know, I wanted a, a large guy. I wanted a African-American or Latino actor. I wanted to have this white lady, man of color situation. And Quentin was our first choice. And um, through Donna McKenna, our casting director, uh, we got to Quentin's agent and uh, he decided to take a chance with it. They both did, you know, so. And then the location uh, scouted a lot of different stairs in Hollywood. The stairs that originally the incident happened on were not suitable for filming. They were too narrow. And so eventually we found these stairs in Silver Lake. 
called Esther's Steps, the, the Land of Street Steps, which were perfect. You know, there were a series of steps intersecting three streets. And I rewrote the script to those to that location, broke it down. Uh, you know, it was shot over a four day period, three of which were on the stairs. And uh, you can't shoot this in one day, you know, it's too many pages. So we plotted it out, we rehearsed it ourselves, and then the actors joined us pre-shooting to walk the steps. And they were also somewhat daunted by the physicality of it. You know, this is a really rough, rough shoot in a lot of ways. Uh, anyway, so I broke it down into three days. You know, day one is from here to here, day two and day three. And it went very smoothly, it was unbelievable. Uh, it, was ex it, would, it could have been chaos, you know. Um, we shot it in script order for the actors and for, for me and for the crew. And it came off. That's amazing. Amazing. Lorenzo, a question uh, I have. How did you get uh, two airlift actors, Quentin Aaron and Sean Young? This is an incredible achievement. Well, like I said, it was the um, friendship with Sean's sister that uh, got that started, you know. And then we had, Sean lives in Atlanta. She came into LA for some things and Kathleen arranged a lunch with us out in Malibu. And I, I drove down from Ventura and we, we had lunch and she had read it by then. And she, of course she wanted to meet me. And, you know, it's tough for an actor to put your hand, put yourself in the hands of someone you don't know, even if the script is terrific and, you know, can they direct and what are, are they sensitive to your needs as an actor? Uh, but apparently the lunch went well enough. I thought it went great, but you can't force people, you know, they're certainly not doing it for the money. I mean, they both got paid and, uh, you know, uh, and it was affordable to me and, and worth their time to come and do it. Um, but, uh, so that was great. It's a great affirmation for a writer that uh, actors turn on to your work. Uh, Quentin Aaron, as I said, came through casting director. Uh, and um, he was my first choice and we got him. So there was very little compromise there. Once that came on board, that helped to attract the crew because they want to work on something that's, you know, going to get seen and it's going to come off. Uh, so that's how it happened. And that would help their careers. So, but did you, you mentioned Donna Mac, uh, Mac who is McKenna. yours? Kenna. So would you recommend her as a good casting agent? for? Very good. She's out of New York and uh -huh. a lot of work. She actually had done some things with Sean before. And she, uh, she put us in touch with uh, Don Landrum, who's an agent in uh, Louisiana, which was where... Uh, Quentin was living at the time. Quentin is from the Bronx. He lives in Nashville now, but he's, you know, he's an itinerant actor. He moves around where the work is. But Don Landrum read it. And you have to get on people's good side, you know, with this stuff. Um, and they were, they were the kind of agents that I like, you know, they weren't obstructive agents. You know, big actors have a firewall and, in front of them and you cannot get to them unless you've got, they say, make an offer. Well, sometimes you can't make an offer. You know, you don't, you don't have the money to make an offer. Even a short film, you know, some of the other actors we're looking at were going, well, that's 10,000 a day. I say, you're crazy, you know? So, uh, so you find a way, you know, and I was at some point ready to make it with complete unknowns, hoping the story would, would sell itself. But, you know, it is a star system and much as I don't like it sometimes, you have to realize the uh, it's a star system for a reason. Exactly. You know? But uh, working with the, the, you went through the agents, not the managers, right? In Sean's case, it was a manager and, and a personal connection to her sister. In Quentin's case, it was an agent, yeah. Okay, because I've heard sometimes the managers, and I know from my son's career as an actor, that managers really seem to look at your at the life path and what's good for the actor, where agents only want to know what's the bottom line, how much money, right? I think that could be true, yes. And if you have a personal connection, all the better. I mean, you know, 
I've, I've heard stories where people take a script to a funeral to try and get it to somebody. It's like, oh my God, I mean, how desperate are you? And, you know, I don't know how well that goes over. Uh, but, you know, people have tried everything in this business. It's, it's a disease, you know. Filmmaking is, is like a virus. You, you have to become infected uh, willingly uh, and then hopefully survive the process because it's really not for the timid, you know. And, and your viewers from the heart people know sometimes you go, geez, do I have it in me to, to go down this road? Now, I've been down that road a lot, so I've answered that question for myself long ago. But you still have to be careful because you could get in serious trouble. Right. No, tenacity is the backbone of the filmmaker. They just have to keep going like that energizer buddy. You just can't give up. It's a total commitment. So I remember when I first uh, talked to you, about your Stairway to the Stars application. And, and I started listening to you and it, you had everything memorized. You knew every scene and the dialogue and the look you wanted and the energy and the emotion of the film. Um, I felt that you had this unrelenting vision of the final film and you were determined to achieve your vision, period. I know that you were very picky on who you chose for all of the uh, uh, jobs on your cast, your music, your color, your editing, everything. You were very careful to get the very best. So what I want to know is how do you get to that place with the film where it's part of your DNA? Well, you know, you have to become one with it, you know. Uh, I've done a lot of theater and I've been through the, the mill in terms of when things get tough, you gotta be the calmest person on the set. You have to be almost a Yoda-like character and, and let the tension and everything be absorbed by the people around you, the assistant director and what have you. Because you can't really show that, you know. We've seen very recently what happens when people in power lose it and we won't make any direct references, but we know what we're talking about here. People of huge power that really are not equipped to handle it. And there is a certain amount of power involved in, in being a storyteller, especially if you're a writer director. Sometimes people don't trust, producers especially, don't trust writer directors because they figure they're too in love with their own words. Uh, you know, when, when Sean and Quentin got on board and we did some Zoom rehearsals with them, uh, and then later when they came to town and the few days we had with them before we shot, I had to be open, you know, to script changes, not huge ones, but mostly from Sean, you know, I was a little worried. I said, oh my God, she's going to come down on me. So now that I've hired her, she's going to bury me with all these changes from a, a movie star point of view. And she wasn't, you know, she, she was in, she was coming at it from the character's point of view, you know. And uh, a few things I said, no, I don't want to change that. But a lot of things I did change and all for the better. So, you know, you relax around people. You have to be personable. The DNA thing, um, yeah, it's, it's sort of irritating to have someone with so much passion in the room, you know. It's like, oh, my God, ease up a little bit, you know. But until you can ease up, you really have to be the voice of the project, you know. And uh, everybody's different. You know, some pe people are uncomfortable with that kind of control. Um, I try to keep my eye on the, on the finished product, the, the, the vision of the thing. Uh, you know, keeping as a film editor for many years, I, I had to defend the films I was editing from the people who hired me to edit the film. They could have fired me, you know, in 22 years of film editing, I never got fired. I came close a couple of times, but... Um, I got advice from some veteran filmmaker, film editors that I met and who counseled me. And they said, you know, if you get in a tight spot, you have to defend the movie from these people. The people who hired you, the producer pays you and the director, you're there at the director's uh, behest, you know? And uh, it's, it's, you're, you're the guardian in a way. 
So I, I learned a lot from editing about writing, about politics, about you know how to hang on to a vision of something, and to make the film a living entity, you know, uh, to be protected because film is very fragile. Uh, it's an unnatural filmmaking is not a natural process. Documentaries maybe a little more so, but even then, this is, goes against nature, you know, uh, to try and harness these forces and and put them together. That's why filmmaking is so tough, you know, and why so few films really come out great, because you're running up against a kind of wall of reality. It, it's almost like, is this really supposed to happen? You, you're forcing it, you know, but there's no way around it. You have to go through that uh, kind of cauldron, that, that crucible, to come out the other side with something hopefully worth worth the trouble, you know. Yes, some good story. Totally about Lorenzo. story, in my, so, in my belief, yeah. Lorenzo, what do you think are important traits of a good director? Well, it depends who you ask. I mean, some, some actors would tell you a director who says nothing. Leave me alone. <laughs> uh, let me do what I, what I do. Others say, I need help. You know, uh, uh, you're not giving me enough. Uh, you know, I worked on a TV series called Life Goes On for four seasons as the supervising editor, the producer I later directed for them as well. And every episode had a different director. They'd come and go. It was interesting because a series like that, the actors are, you know, Patti Lapone was in this, was in the series, Bill Smitrovich, uh, and very experienced actors, they don't want to be messed with too much on a series. They want to explore, but the characters are set already. And a lot of directors come in and try to, you know, they have eight days to shoot a, an episode. And it's a tough job because you have to fit into what's already going on in the series, but hopefully make it your own, your episode, you know? And uh, a lot of directors come and go, very experienced people. Uh, and some of them didn't seem to understand actors too, too much, but they, uh, they had made it in the business just by their efficiency, you know? They know how to shoot. And get it done. They, they make the day, as they say. Make the day, you know, five pages, six pages, whatever it is. And their direction was very minimal. Like you hear this a lot: "Give me more," or "A little less," or you know, quantify. I call it quantifiable directing. Um, Woody Allen, Altman, these guys—they don't say much. You the, you interview actors who've worked with these people. They say casting is eighty percent. So if I made the right decision in the casting, you don't want to go in and mess with it. But you want to look for actors that are in trouble and help them out some way. Uh, find the answers together. Um, I'm not, you know, I learned from watching, primarily watching Jonathan Miller, who was a wonderful English stage and theater director, who directed two productions of a play of mine called Camera Obscura and one in Seattle Repertory Theater and one in London at the Almeida Theater. And I was there for both of them. And I learned a lot about directing actors from Jonathan, who, who died a few years ago, fantastic guy, um, who observed very carefully what the actor's first instincts were and then worked with that. Didn't impose, didn't say, you sit here, you lift the glass there. I want it that way, I don't want it any other way. You'd never do that. That's anathema to a director like that. Then again, you have directors who are very dictatorial. So I don't know. You know, it's it's a hard question to answer. You you got to build up life experience and and basically you have to like people. You can't be antisocial in a job like that. You know. Right, but you're right. Actors always have something. Uh, to give if they're really into the character because my son was an actor and they would always they knew he would come in rick dean would come in and say oh i think the character would do this or that and they would say most of his directors knew him and would say 
save it and I'll give you one take. Do your own thing. And quite often they used it, Lorenzo, but at mm -hmm. least he did everything they told him for their take. And then he had the opportunity. He knew it was coming. So yeah. that got a lot of work. But um, I want to go back to some of the things you did on this film. I was really shocked when uh, Carol told me that you were able to rent a house right on the shooting set, right on the stairs, where you imagined shooting. I mean, that's like you created a visual and it all happened. Uh, so tell us about that. You found the stairs and then how did you mm -hmm. find the location room to, to use? Well, you know, the, the, uh, the stair, I, I lived in the, in the Beachwood Canyon, Hollywood Hills for years, and I'd never seen a place like this. The Landa Street Steps, L-A-N-D-A, -A, you can look them up, are very unique. I think there's others like that, but there's no street. The, the houses are on the stairs. The mailbox is on the stairs. The postman climbs the stairs every day to deliver the mail. The people don't have, if they have a garage, it's up above and on another street. In other words, it's challenging. You, you got a piano or a stove or a fridge to come in, you got to bring that sucker up down the stairs wow. and into your house. So the logistics, I didn't want, I didn't want the neighbors to really get wind of what we were doing. Even though we had a permit from city of LA which was granted, by the way, the day before the shoot. It was like kind of real nerve wracking. <laughs> Apparently that's, they do that all the time. I said, God, are you kidding me? A big movie comes in and they don't know till the day before. Anyway, so we got the permit, breathed a sigh of relief. And then, but it was suggested to me by the DP, Jonathan Hall. He says, you know, you don't want honey wagons and production vehicles, which you need a certain amount of support for even a short film. Uh, the equipment truck, uh, you better rent a house. So we rented a house. You know, we were on scouting locations one day and the woman and her son came by and uh, they said, what are you guys doing? I said, well, we're looking to shoot a short here. She goes, oh, I live right over there. I go, and immediately we go, can we see your house? Can, can we use your house as a, a base? You know, we weren't going to shoot there, but we were going to keep our gear there and do makeup and hair and have a lunch break around there, you know, use their kitchen. And we paid them and they were, they had just bought the house. So they needed a little cash to uh, help with some expenses. Lovely couple with a, with a young son. And uh, yeah, they said, okay. So that really saved us a, a lot of time and money and lowered our profile to the point where we were just, Every morning we'd show up there and we'd leave our gear there and come back. It was so easy, you know, mm -hmm. and it was, it cost us less than it would have cost us to rent all the vehicles and where would we have parked them? And then that neighbors complain, who are these guys? You know, uh, so it was, a, it was kind of logistical uh, and a creative decision at the same time. And you followed your instincts. As soon as you found she was in the neighborhood, you jumped right in. That's very important. That's what the story at the end of the class today is all about, using your instincts. But now I want to ask you, because when you're the writer director, that's the creative side. But then the producer part of you is the one who has to maintain the budget, to stay on budget. So how can you maintain the flexibility when you're all three things to cut the costs? I mean, when you know you can cut the costs, uh, who, who takes control, the writer, director, or the producer? Well, you know, I had to change hats and I wanted to, you know, um, because you can't be worrying about that. It comes up, you know, during the shoot, but you want to be insulated somewhat from that. Uh, Andis Solomon was the line producer and first assistant director. He took a lot of weight off my shoulders in terms of, he says, if anyone bothers you, don't even respond to them. Talk, tell them, send them to me, which is a great AD thing. And, uh, you know, and Carol Joyce, you know, when we got the grant, it made sense to bring Carol Joyce on as an executive producer. And, uh, Carol was extremely 
helpful in logistical and creative matters. We found the editor through Carol, Monroe Robertson. We found a lot of talent. We found Keith Lewis, who ended up playing a small part. Thomas Beaumont, who ended up playing Tommy, the manager, all came from Carol. The location of the apartment building on Cherimoya in Hollywood came through Carol and her contacts. So, so it was not any illusion that I am some kind of wunderkind who did it all. You need to have a lot of help, but you need to change hats. You know, when you're directing, the actors are going, "Hey, I'm right here. Focus on me, not on did the did the set did the prop arrive or." You know what I mean? They need to know that you're focused on them. And you need to shoot the movie. Uh, but, uh, you know, a four day shoot is relatively painless. You can imagine if you're on a long shoot, uh, things go wrong every hour of every day, you know. And you need, of course, we had a small crew, I think maybe 20 people. And I said, what do we need so many people for? But I tell you what, we needed every one of those people. I realized that as we got after the first day, we got kind of breathed and said, okay, wow, we got through day one. And everybody was there, especially with the stairs, you know, um, we couldn't use a generator because that adds a ton of money to the permit because it's in a fire zone and a, a generator could cause a fire. So I didn't know that. Okay. So we switched over to batteries, heavy batteries for, powering the lights. It was mostly a natural light thing, but you know, you needed some fill light and that had to be powered by something. Uh, we had power at the house, but we needed power on the stairs. So the crew was lifting, you know, the young, young people, men and women, hefting this stuff up these stairs every day. It was necessary to have that. So, you know, you learn, no matter how many of these things you've done, you cannot go in thinking you know it all because that's arrogant. You know, you, you don't. Can you uh, give us uh, tips on how you raised additional funds for Stairway to the Stars? Well, it's interesting. Um, it, they, almost all of it came from people who uh, helped me before. Uh, hearing is believing the film that Carol mentioned this documentary about Rachel Flowers, a phenomenal young musician from Oxnard, from this area, who's been blind since birth, a true uh, genius savant of music. She's 28 now. We met her when she was 20. And we tapped into, that was about a $300,000 documentary feature. Um, we tapped into a global fan base of Rachel's which has only grown since. And uh, we had about 200 funders for that film from among her fan base, $10 people, $25 people, $100 people and up. Primarily the funding came from, from one person uh, who became an executive producer on that film, Patty Channer. But this one was, and I knew that was never gonna happen again. It was a unique case because of Rachel Flowers and her beautiful nature and, and her large fan base. Stairway to the Stars is like just another short film. Like, and you can't promise people big returns. There is none. You know, you've got to be willing to throw away that money just to make the piece. We're exploring ways to monetize short films, but I'll tell you right now, it's very limited. Um, so these people who did come on board for the additional funds uh, were people that trusted me, you know, from before, from several from hearing is believing. Uh, and uh, it's gratifying, you know, to know that when they see you walking down the street, they don't cross to the other side to get away from you because they know you're going to ask them for money again. They came willingly on board. I had to ask, of course, to let people know what I'm doing and say, and I never asked for any specific amount, ever. I'd say, listen, if you wanna come in, here's what we're doing. That way they don't feel obligated, you know? Um, we did have a, a crowdfunding page uh, uh, on uh, We Did It, 
which is the platform that, that uh, um, From the Heart uses, among others. I had never used them before, but it was successful. I think we raised about 13, 14,000 on that tax exempt contributions from people, very from $50 up to, we had a $10,000 person come in on that. Um, so yeah, it was a very mixed bag. Great. Well, and I we would... barely got through production on that. You know, we fell short in post, which often happens. And I had to make some decisions about post-production uh, changing some, some uh, priorities around. So we just couldn't raise the rest that we needed. So we, but we finished the film. It was, we got a great sound mix out of uh, my friend Gary Bourgeois and Jared Orlando at, at uh, South Lake Audio in Burbank. And, uh, and they did that for me as a, as a gift, you know. So oh, these are relationships that go back, you know. New filmmakers, it's harder, I think, because you don't have a lot of connections. You can't rely on that kind of network of people. But if you've been doing this for a while and you haven't burned too many bridges, people will help. You know. This is very true, and that's why the film grant, I love the film grant because we give us uh, goods and services with the grant, which is really important because it's introducing people to the Hollywood uh, best, the best people in Hollywood, in my opinion, who really have a heart, who love independent filmmakers, who take good care of them, have decent prices, mm -hmm. But most important, um, they care. They care about filmmakers. And so getting to know the right people is the first thing for uh, a, an emerging or even an established filmmaker. If you're switching over from docs to features and you want to do a short, it's who you know in Hollywood. Definitely, I think. I think so too. I mean, and, you know, people are, that's why when you talk to people in Hollywood, they're always looking over your shoulder at who else is it coming into the room that they may be better place to give their attention to than to you you know you see that a lot but right. i think we had we had some help from is it richard kaufman yes uh, right who's one of your what's the name of this company film something tools film tools film tools we bought some a couple of big drives from him uh david rakeland did some consulting with us early on uh, Dan Chapman did our poster, a new oh, poster started. for us, who right. I knew separately. I knew Dan through his, his brother Emmett. And so, you know, there were these overlaps. Uh, but yeah, the donor list of yours is, is extremely helpful. Some things maybe not apply to other, to all the films like animation. Well, you might not need animation, but um, so you, you cherry pick that wonderful list you have. And uh, the ones that can help often do at, you know, discounted rates. Right. This is very important. Uh, I recommend always that you go to our list of donors and look, there's some in New York and some in LA and go through them for what you need because I've been through a lot of potential sound recording, for example, or editors or, a color correction and found the people who I love. And, and these people have been donating to the grant many times, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. So um, they are cherry picked for you. I recommend that you uh, call them, get an estimate, tell them who you are, introduce yourself, say you saw them online at From the Heart and see what kind of a uh, price they will give you. Um, when I ran the film company, uh, when people would come to me, they were doing their budgets and I would always give them a price for the budget. And then I would say, when you have the funding, come back to me and I'll see if I can make any special improvement on that. So you always make the best deals when you've got the money and you're ready to write the check the same day. Uh, know that in Hollywood, right, Lorenzo? You found that? Well, everybody likes to get paid, you know, uh, and various people have different levels of flexibility, you know, but yeah, I was, I'm not sure where we are in the script, but I, I was looking at the clock and do we have, make sure you have time for people who have any questions. Um, 
Yes. But uh, yes. whatever you guys want to do, but um, I'm here for you and I'm enjoying it. Yeah, we can go to uh, the audience, the questions. Uh, and actually, th this one will tie in with one Falgun Jane is asking. Um, why do you think filmmakers should make short films? And then someone like Falgun is asking, they've never done one. Where do they start? I know Falguni Jane. She's a lovely young woman from Maharashtra, India. Hi, Falguni. Are you there on camera? If not, hello. Um, well, I, you know, Falguni's a writer. Uh, I just read a short story of hers called The Cursed House. And, uh, uh, and if she has aspirations to make that, maybe that's what she's talking about, that particular short story. A real chilling, wonderful short story, kind of Edgar Allan Poe influenced, uh, like the telltale heart, you know. You just have to pull in the resources, you know, and it does take some money to do it. But then I often wonder, could I have done Stairway to the Stars for nothing? And the way it turned out, I think the answer is no, I could not have. Um, those actors fall away really fast. The actors go away, the, the high-end camera goes away, you shoot it with an iPhone, you know, you start to diminish your expectations. The key thing is the story, you know, so you don't want to get too caught up in the technical aspect of it, like you're going to shoot in, in, with the best cameras and lenses that, that are out there. You have to, at some point, uh, reduce your expectations. The last thing to go is the story. So whatever it takes. Yeah. Exactly. So a, a good question from Chelsea Kenya, and uh, she's asking, did you have a festival and distribution strategy for the film? If so, how did you select which festivals or channels? Asking as someone with two very different shots in pre-production. Well, I don't think you choose the festival, they choose you, you know. Um, the strategy was, I was familiar with festival outreach. Film has been submitted, so we're waiting for some answers. Uh, that's, that's perilous though, you know, you, you uh, have to have a thick skin. If you don't get in, you wonder, why didn't they take me? Uh, it's almost mm -hmm. like a love affair, you know, get all dolled up. You go to the dance hall and no one wants to dance with you, you know. Say, like, what the hell is happening here? I thought I was pretty attractive, you know. Say, so, no, not this night. Nobody wants to dance with you this night. You have to be able to weather that kind of, I mean, writers, if you're a writer like I am, you, you know, when the pandemic hit, people said, how are you doing? I said, hey, I'm just doing the same thing. I'm used to being ignored. I'm used to being isolated. So it's, it's certain not to minimize it or anything, but it was not a big shock, you know, that suddenly you're, you're all by yourself. Um, but uh, so the strategy is, well, be careful. There's a lot of crappy festivals out there, I must tell you. There's a lot of people being used to make money. Filmmakers full of hope and ambition, would-be novelists. Uh, there's a lot of predators out there. They may not think of themselves as that, but I see them as that. Can you and go into the say, specifics of that? Like, what do you mean? Uh, what what well, do you mean take, people that take see. advantage of you? They take what? big fees to, to give you advice and, and uh -huh. uh, you know what I mean? Not yes. that it's, not that, you know, entry fees on festivals vary from $10, $15 up to $60, $70. 90, 100, 130. Right. If, you do, do if you do your film and director, no, but you want to do your film and director and first time director, you have to well, do those, all three of those, don't you? Well, not really. Those multiple categories, that's the ripoff right there. Well, they yeah, but don't you have to do all three to get one? Just enter one category. Is, you, is that what? Chelsea? Is that your name? No, I'm Mariana. Oh, no, this is Mariana. Oh, hi, Mariana. Mariana, um, the Invisible Children of L.A. about young children that are homeless. Uh-huh. Yeah, we well, won a lot. Be careful about these multiple category things, because that's basically, you may say, okay, let me enter three categories. Well, suddenly you've spent a couple hundred bucks. Exactly. And I wouldn't do it, you know. Enter well. First of all, judge the festival itself. If you go to Film Freeway, 
which is where a lot of people enter. You see, how long has that festival been there? One year, two years. Okay, maybe good. Maybe there's good people. Do your research, you know. Don't just jump on, though, because festivals are money-making things. They make a ton of money on entry fees. And I, I never enter in more than one category. Short film. That's it. No director, no actor. But what if you're a first-time director and you're a senior? That's it a, doesn't matter. That's an sure winner about a topic that everybody in the world loves, the most immoral topic on our planet. That's the well, most immoral topic. So people are, um, uh, you know what I'm saying, it's the most shameful disgrace, homeless children. Right. So when you have a topic like that, and you're a senior, and you've never made a film before, you're bound to get an award. Well, I don't know that kind of expectation really holds. There's a difference. Well, I have. Work. I've I made many awards so far. Well, yeah. Well, that went your way because probably of the quality of the film you made, not because you're a senior or anything, right? No, not because I'm a senior, no. That you may want to not stress a whole lot, you know what I'm saying? Oh, uh, really? Well, I, you know, ages. I'm a story. woman. I'm a woman and a first time filmmaker. Yeah. Well, that all plays into it. You know, it's a difference between, Marianne, between you feel how special you feel you are and how special the world feels you are. When you make it personal like that, like I'm a senior woman, Asian, whatever, those are categories that, that do hit certain buttons for people. But I'd focus on the film you've made, not on who you are. Just disappear. The film is what they're gonna judge. The That's cult of personality is, is elusive and dangerous. We see that. Wait, the person's personality? The cult of personality. You know, selling yourself. You have Michael Moore, who's out there up front with his movies. He's been very successful with that. Uh, and he does it very well. Uh, that's who he is. And he's cultivated that cult of personality from the left point of view. You've got people on the right doing the same thing. But that's about them and, and it's about their story, their message. But for everyone else, I, I, I didn't want people to look at my work and, and <clears throat> notice me particularly, no. but to notice what I made with my friends, with my colleagues. So be careful of those multiple entry fees, they'll kill you, you know. Uh-huh. Yes, my that, daughter's that's already the predatory have disowned nature me. Of it. My daughters that's have the... disowned me, and we're all close. I, this is my first birthday that they will not come to. I mean, we're not- I'm, hoping, being, I'm just gonna jump in. I hope we can move on to some other questions, maybe. Yeah, sorry, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, okay, anyway, anyway, let's- uh, just, A hell of a lot of your, money. Keep your eyes okay. open. Don't, don't be gullible about Thank these you. things. Be careful. Thank you. Okay, Loren, do you want to ask a question? I'll unmute you. Go ahead. Well, I did send one into the chat when we were talking about casting agents because um, I found this website something like castingagents.com or something. And it said, if you pay a subscription, then you're gonna have access to A-list actors, publicists. And so my question was, is that a rookie mistake or is that actually legit? Just cause I'm, I feel like such an outsider just from the beginning, at, just in the beginning of my career. And I just don't really understand how I would even approach A-listers from where I'm at. Well, I don't know that particular site, but it sounds fishy. Uh, it sounds like actors are, come to Hollywood say be, be an actor sign up for headshots and this and that I tell you there's a lot of abuses going on out there and people will slave as a waitress a waiter to get the money to do these things they're supposed to do it's tough being new at it you know I'm not trying to be just to say because I've done this for a while I have all the answers by no means but um, that kind of sounds dicey to me uh, the promises are too high, right? If it's, what's the old thing? If it sounds too good to be true, it is too good to be true. Uh, you have to use your own judgment there, but uh, believe me, there's plenty of people looking to suck money out of you uh, in exchange for your dreams. And yet you have to do something, you know? Uh, it's hard. Uh, if you're not the most social person or you don't have those connections, uh, it's a very tough thing. Uh, but you got to use your common sense and don't pull out the debit card too quick, you know. 
That's good but ask, question, ask questions, you know, this, what you're doing on this. I mean, I don't want to dissuade you from, from looking into things that you think might be legitimate, but you have to learn for yourself. After, after a few times, you go, wait a second, that didn't pay off. And my money's gone. They don't give it back. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, here's a question. Uh, how important are named actors to shorts? And then also followed, this is by Richard Farmer. And then what is the length of your short film? What was the final cost? Well, I don't want to necessarily share the final cost, but it was under six figures. Um, and the length is 25 minutes, which is just about the length. When it was done as a play, it was 19 minutes. So it expanded a little bit, which is understandable when it was filmed. Um, as far as the importance of Named. actors, yeah, it can be helpful. Um, I don't think the world opens up completely. I mean, you get Brad Pitt to do your short film. I think that may be a different story. Uh, but all levels of actors, if they're committed to the piece and they want to help you do it, grab them and, and you, you know, make it make a place for them. So you have to, in this business, it seems to me, if I've learned one thing, it's that you have to make opportunities for other people to prosper. If not financially, then creatively, or both, if they can. Right. You can't just be about your own glorification. That you're going to make it as a director, this and that. You have to really be inclusive uh, with the dream. Make, let them in and, and let them gain something for themselves, whether it's your gaffer, your sound guy, your DP, they all, they got plenty of other places to go besides you. So you have to, for those three or four days you're shooting, in our case, you need to make it a home for them. Uh, and they, so they don't leave, they're thinking, well, that was a waste of time. So that's part of the, the atmosphere, I guess you create, you know? Yes, okay. but they love the set. They love what they've just experienced. That's important. Now, he did, do we have any more questions? Yes, uh, one more that's very interesting from Roger Edwards. Uh, and I think Neil has one. I'll, I'll unmute you, Neil. Let's cover Roger first. Um, I have a proof of concept short for a feature. How can I use it to capture attention of an industry professional who has a POD or can get project into development? Packaging it with established talent. Whiplash is commonly used as example of this. Whiplash, the, the, yeah, right. Well, there's so many stories out there about how people managed to pull that off. As I said before, Stairway to the Stars was not the, used as a leverage for a short film. So that was, relieved me of that pressure of saying, you know, I wanna take this further. I, I just wanted to tell this story and that was it, you know. Um, I've never used a short film to leverage into a feature. So maybe I'm not qualified to, to answer that question. Um, all I would say is there's a lot of, similar to that advice about festivals and casting consultants and this and that. Uh, you have to really have your antenna sharpened up here in terms of who you trust. Not to mention your idea is vulnerable to being ripped off, uh, even if it's copyrighted, you know. Um, but uh, I don't know. I mean, sh Stairway to the Stars, I'm going to be using to help with a feature I'm doing called Shipment Day based on my play in Hawaii, but a million and a quarter budgeted feature, uh, which from the heart is a fiscal sponsor on that one as well. Um, and it's there, to, even though I'm an experienced filmmaker, you still need to redefine yourself for people. So either I'm from Hawaii and I know a lot of people in Hawaii, you still have to show them what you can do. So that 25 minute film will come in very handy for me in terms of funders and potential partners, crew people to say, what have you done lately, Lorenzo? Because people wanna know what you did last week, you know? And you may be able to show them something. So uh, it remains to be seen whether that will cinch a deal and, and someone will write a big check based on, on that short film. But it certainly doesn't hurt. No, I would think that would be very beneficial for you. It uh, could be, yeah. yeah. 
Yes. Uh, Carol, let's go to one more question. I think Neil Kendricks, you had a question, right? Uh, this, uh, I hit a mute on your end. Okay. Hi, hello everyone. Um, this is kind of a variation of the question I wrote in the chat. Um, I was wondering if you might be able to give us uh, or share with us some strategies of how to craft uh, the most effective brand application and support of your short film, whether it's narrative or live action or even animation. Um, you know, maybe in within that, if you could, uh, if you have any insights of maybe common mistakes that we can avoid as we kind of develop our, um, you know, our materials to try to seek funding. Mm -hmm. And thank you for taking my question. Sure. Um, well, you know, the, the only grant I applied for for this was the From the Heart grant. I looked at some others. I think you have to see the suitability of your story and, and don't submit it where it's not going to be appreciated. Uh, you know, whatever um, platforms you're using to find grants. If it's a narrative, well, don't apply to a documentary grant, that's for sure. You know, we've got to really focus in on uh, what the story is. If there's a, a racial related aspect, a gender related aspect, um, then uh, I don't know if we lost ourselves here or not. But No, no, um, continue. I just put your are, contact okay. information. Um, basically, uh, read the, the um, requirements very carefully you know, in terms of what they're asking for. And just hone it down to the essence, essential information they want. What is the piece about, why do you want to tell this story? Why should they support it? I don't know if that's the only three things you should address, uh, but those are the, it seems to me those are the main things. I don't know if you agree, do you, do you agree? I do. I think you're absolutely right. My three things are story, story, and more story, Neil. Tell me a story, a compelling story. And Lorenzo, I was watching uh, the Cannes Film Festival here in my house, which was great fun. And they had the uh, two people, only two people run Netflix there, and two people run Amazon. And both these were uh, their uh, teams that chose films. And they said, uh, send us an email with your story. What's your story? That's what I want to know. Mm -hmm. I want the story. And then I want, who are you? And why are you making this film? And if you're making this film to open the door in Hollywood, then terrific. That's a good reason. Uh, and if you're making it because you're attached to the subject matter in some way or another, that's another good reason. So you had a great story. Uh, you had carried that story with you for years. Uh, you could tell from reading the material, your passion. This is what I say. Put some passion in your project, man. Don't just put all the words on the page. Put your heart on the page. Tell me. Who are you and why you want to make this film? That's what works with us. And I think it works with a lot of people. Yeah, I think, uh, Neil, you have to convey that, you know, um, put yourself on their, in their perspective. If you're being assaulted by filmmakers every day, they become the enemy, you know, even though it's your job to, to help people, there's a kind of, it's be like, like a waiter in a restaurant. I was a waiter. It's, uh, you rely on these people to make a living, but you always have some contempt for them for even coming out to eat, you know, because they have the money and you don't or whatever. There's this, this management labor thing, that this rivalry that runs all the way through society, the haves, the have-nots, the, the wants, and the, the people that have what you want. So you have to kind of empathize with their situation they see so much right now it's just like unending f flood of of people wanting help yes it can't be can't be easy carol you can speak to this no it isn't easy in fact it's really very hard uh it's uh something that you get very emotional about when you see all these great talented people and you only have so much money it's very upsetting yeah 
it is, but the point is uh, the passion, the story, the determination. Uh, we've had a lot of people win our grant that came back three or four times. That is, is what I say. Tenacity is the backbone of the filmmaker. And uh, we always give uh, consultations for everyone who applies, which is the benefit to apply. First of all, when you apply for a grant, you have to stretch out and say things that you may not want to say because a lot of filmmakers are very private individuals, but you have to put your heart on the page because that's what we're looking for. So you do all that and then you don't win. Well, don't be discouraged, get feedback. What can I do to make it better? That's what filmmakers ask us. And Carol Joyce does a wonderful job at that. And so do I, but because we want you to get better. And that's why From the Heart does events like this uh, because it, it's education. We're always learning every day. And the moment you say, I think I've got it, look out, you don't. You're going to have to learn something new to get through the next day. So thank you, uh, Lorenzo, for all your wonderful information. We all really appreciate it. Yes, applaud for Lorenzo. You did a fabulous job. You went Thanks out there. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Got that location, shot that film, and got those two stars. That's vision. And this is what I, I really want to do is to encourage all of you to use your instincts. He jumped at the opportunity to get Sean from uh, the writer friend that was her sister. I mean, what a great in. But he, he used his instincts. He went, he showed her the film. She took the, uh, she took the bait. She got on with him. So it's all about instincts. I think that... Uh, it's important and how, how they can benefit you in this industry. So Tommy Adams, a friend of mine, and he's been setting up Bob Evans in his book, The Kid Stays in the Picture, for us to listen to when we're driving around. And Bob Evans tells stories of creating films while he was running Paramount Studios, and they're incredible. And he dictated this. He's a brilliant writer. And his delivery of the information is spellbinding. And one of the things I want to share with you is a story of how Evans used his immediate instincts to search and, someone, and find someone who became a household name and a top movie star, someone we all enjoy. Evans put his attention on every phase of filmmaking for all the films made at Paramount. He was in on the casting, the wardrobe, the set design, the everything. And he tells a story about a film where they were casting the final person for a feature. And Evans had seen scores of people and no one had satisfied him. He couldn't find that one person. So the agent said, don't worry, we found the right person. This actor is the next James Dean and we think you're going to love this actor. So when they showed Evans the scene, it wasn't the James Dean actor that he liked. It was a man who walked in the door, handed the James Dean actor an envelope, looked at the woman, smiled, turned around, walked out. Evans said, Who's the man with the smile? And no one knew who he was. They all said, don't you like the James Dean character? And he said, no, I want to meet the guy with the smile. Well, the agents kept coming back to him saying, we can't find him. We don't know who he is. And Evan said, I'm going to give you two words, find him. All right. And so one of the agents came back and said, okay, we know who he is. Currently, he's working for Roger Corman. He's a writer, actor. And we hear that he does the books for Corman. They say he does everything Roger needs. So right now, he's in Cannes selling a motorcycle film. So Evan says, bring him to me when he gets back. And the agents do just that. They show up at his office with this guy with a smile. So naturally, the guy's agent was so thrilled to be in the same room with Bob Evans that the agent just kept pitching his client. And Evans said, no, that's not allowed. He said, let him talk. I want to know who he is. 
So uh, he started talking to the man. He said, tell me all about yourself. Who are you? I want to know you. And the man with the smile started talking to him. And pretty soon, Evans knew that he had a good actor and he offered him a role in another film that he was making. And he offered him $10,000 to do the part. This is early 70s. And the guy said, can I talk to you alone? So Evans said, sure. And he walked over to the window with the smile guy and said, what's up? He said, could you make that 15,000? And he said, well, how about 12.5? And the actor said, oh, what a great gift. He said, I have an ex-wife and a little girl to take care of. I need that money. Thank you very much. He said, I will never forget this gift. So have you guessed? Anybody guessed? Put your name in the chat bar. Yes, he, uh, there's, a, there's a guest here from Dave. Uh, he sent me a private message, two guesses. The first one is Robert Redford. And the second one is Steve McQueen. No, but you're in the same ballpark. Is uh, close, but not no cigar yet. Um, okay. How about Marco is saying Dennis Hopper? No, Dennis Hopper, great person, but that's not the one. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Peter Fonda from Dave. <laughs> Peter Fonda. No, because he was in that movie that the smile guy was trying to sell. Who else was in that movie? That's the last tip. Who else was in that? Easy Rider. Okay. Uh, Paul Newman. No. <laughs> uh, Jack Nicholson. Got it. Okay, Nich Steve, Steve Davis won that. Nicholson had the smile and oh. Yeah. He was, uh, Bob Evans saw that smile and said, That's, that could be a good actor. You know, he won my heart, but he captivated me. So who is this guy? And so he used his instincts. And that's what Lorenzo did when that woman said, what are you doing over here? We live right up there. Lorenzo jumped on it and found a place and saved the day with the, keeping his crew happy. So I'm here to tell you that filmmakers have more ESP, instincts, gut feeling, whatever you want to call it. You guys have got it. I see that happen all the time because I get to talk to you on a daily basis. And what a joy that is. And I hear all of these fantastic stories where you, your instinct told you to do something and you jumped on it and it was very successful. So know that instincts pay off. Thank you very much for joining us today. And uh, the next class we're having, I've asked Tom Malloy, who is a co-owner in a distribution company, to come give us some tips on what distributors want for films. How do you reach and get to know people of wealth? your high, uh, high net worth individuals, how do you find them? We're gonna get some tips on that. And why is the American film market so important to go to? Those are good questions for Tom. So we'll send you an invite to that. And, uh, and I wish you all easy film funding and lots of good luck. Thanks. Thank you everyone for joining. Bye. Lots of fun.